afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, hope you can all hear me, and I hope it's not something you'll come to regret. There's a hell of a lot to go through. I'm happy to take questions, but it's best afterwards, I think. Otherwise, I, I will lose track of where I am. Um, this talk has been modified from a talk I gave to the uh, Society of Jewellery Historians in London, um, which includes a lot of young ladies, um, but all totally uninformed about engine turning. And there's a benefit of that kind of audience is no awkward questions and a bit of a sprinkling of beauty in the audience. So, uh, but anyway, I, I hope that's not too insulting. Um, right. I, I thank those who've inspired me and assisted me in various ways, particularly in my search for good images. Uh, Ali Maharali, Phil Bedford, Philip White, Catherine Purcell, Judy Rudo, Emily Herdman, Dr. Richard Edgecombe, Joanna Wally, Jeremy Salisbury, Mike Windsor, Nick Edwards, John Edwards, Donald Broad, and Stefan Muser of Crot Auctions, Vacheron Constantin, the watchmakers, and plus several people who sadly have died. And if I don't mention you, you'll know there's no justice in the world. Anyway, my subject is engine turning, otherwise known as Gearshay. In my more talk, I will try to cover as many facets of this little known subject, which deserves to be better known and appreciated. Uh, it basically comprises shallow cuts in series made, uh, made by a hand operated machine, normally onto metal and usually in parallel, to form geometric faceted patterns which create an intriguing reflective effect. Engine turning is referred to in books on jewellery and related products, but is generally only referred to in passing as a comment, engine turned, with no further detail as to how this beautiful effect is achieved. There's only one published book devoted to the subject, and that was by Martin Matthews. That's his book, which is quite rare. Um, I'm not involved in any commercial way in a jewellery trade, but for as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by all fine crafts and skills, particularly antique watches, enamelling, engraving, and various metal decorating techniques, culminating in engine turning, uh, which could be considered a mania. Um, I'm qualified as a public health engineer, probably you would call it a sanitary engineer or some version of that. Uh, I'm a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management. Um, I have a small company which deals with all manner of public health uh, engineering work, which largely relates to water, clean or polluted, water mains, pipes, pumps, tanks, manholes, pump stations, wastewater treatment and drainage. I spend 65% of my time writing very detailed technical reports about such systems, especially defective ones. So you'll appreciate why I sometimes need to think about the nicer things of life. Um, I speak as an enthusiast on engine turning, not as an expert. This is not false modesty. And sometimes I'm credited with knowledge I know I don't possess. Uh, this is pleasing and it's good for my ego, but it's countered by the fear of being found out by awkward questions. Anyway, um, I came to be interested by way of genetics and happy chance. My great grandfather and my grandfather, let's go back, sorry. Um, great grandfather came across from the Black Forest in the 1850s and they were watchmakers in what was my hometown and their business started in 1874. And as for as long as I can remember, I've collected and worked on pocket watches. And for many years, I would attend a market in London early Friday morning, spend the mortgage money and the living money to buy watches, and then go off to work in design drawing offices, and they would spend every waking hour trying to get them repaired uh, so I could sell those that I had to. Um, I would do my best to hang on to the best pieces, but most of them had to go, and sometimes the choice was agonising. I also spent years with sore eyes complaining to my doctor. I never quite accepted I was just tired out. But one day in Gravesend, I saw a silver pocket watch in an antique shop. It had something I'd not seen before, a lovely silver dial, including engine turning, applied gold numerals, and hand engraving. It cost me four pounds, probably five dollars, or probably two dollars then, but uh, uh, that was in the days when towns were individual and interesting and not as they are now, which is homogenized, starbucked and uh, McDonaldized is my expression. Intrigued by this watch dial, I asked a fellow con collector, Alec Marsden, where I could find out more. He invited me to attend the meeting of the Society of Ornamental Turners, saying, if we're lucky, there'll be a man there who knows. He was there and I was privileged to meet Martin Matthews, the watch case maker. Um, an author of the only published book on the subject. Sadly, Martin died a few years ago. 
Uh, when I joined the Society of Ornamental Turners, my son Joseph was very young and unable to pronounce ornamental. Uh, he referred to it as the Society of Mental Turners. And uh, time, time, time proved he's correct, and he has joined. So anyway, I, I then made a visit to another member's workshop, which housed a superb ornamental turning lathe by, by George Birch. And to me, it was a vision, mahogany, steel, and brass, and cabinets full of beautiful accessories, all in the best traditions of Victorian engineering. It was a revelation. I'd never seen or heard of anything like it, and I was hooked. You know, it was love at first sight. And to some extent, from then on, watches took something of a backseat. Uh, as a result, my aspirations went from this, my tiny first, first tiny watchmaker's lathe, and culminated in these machinery crammed workshops. Uh. Incidentally, I had a visit from an Israeli a few months ago. Um, he stepped into the first workshop and he used a word which I'd, he didn't think I would understand. And he's, remember, he was only at the first workshop. He said, Meshugana. And it, some of you understand what it means. And he was, I think, a little put out when he thought I understood it, but I took it as a compliment. Because I think it means crazy man. Um, but anyway, anyway, um, these. Uh, these sort of things went on to uh, larger objects. This uh, Keller medallion maker's lathe weighs two tons. It's about 10 feet long. Um, the guilty party here who uh, enabled me to buy it um, persuaded me without difficulty. It was much more up my street than his. Um, and also, then there's this Kempf geometric lathe from the, uh, the Bank of England printing works. It's basically the ultimate engine turning machine. Um, the ultimate spirograph, they are incredible pieces of kit um, used for generating the printing plates for the your banknotes um, and uh, security documents. The main problem with acquisitions like these is space and manual handling and results in deliveries and disasters like this. The shipment from the USA have a very valuable antique lathe and a collection of engine turned brass plates and mis mishandled and the crate smashed in transit. Underneath that top crate, there was a, a beautiful engine, ornamental lathe. Um, big deliveries like this, uh, the camp uh, required a huge vehicle, the ramp to shift it. A forklift carrying the camp lathe, uh, I told the driver, transport drivers, I said, don't go that way, don't go that way, don't bang, down it went, anyway, so, um, but, Moving the Keller machine finally culminated, and I'm, this is fact, in a moment of extreme personal self-realisation. My, my mania was out of control and beyond normal rational behaviour. Uh, as the machine in its crate was lifted by crane into the sky, tangling with overhead wires, um, I realised, David, you're mad. You know, and really, sometimes my spirit quails at my own follies and acquisitions, especially when they're successful. Um, watching clock collectors and people, the small things, don't suffer from problems like this. Um, sometimes, before my mania was an admitted condition, I would arrange machinery deliveries for when my wife, Anita, was out. Uh, <laughs> regrettably, with such things, unlike watches, you can't just breeze home and casually produce your latest purchase at some auspicious moment and comment, it will be worth so much more when I've restored it. Uh, I know this is not directly relevant to engine turning, but it's perhaps a warning to where your innocent interests might lead. Um, so be thankful if you can limit your treasures to things that fit in your pocket or at least into the boot of your car. The origin and date, actual date of the invention of engine turning on metal is not known and is usually considered to be somewhere in the mid-1700s when it started to appear on watch cases and gold boxes. However, I see every reason for its actual origin to have been much earlier, not least because rose engine turn works in ivory are known from much earlier. For example, in the v &A Museum, there's a beautiful ivory box ornamentally turned on a rose engine containing a miniature of Anne of Cleves dating 1539. Uh, therefore, the equipment and knowledge was available but perhaps early works in precious metal have succumbed to the melting pot, leaving no firm evidence. Where are we gone? Um, much as is happening today with wonderful pocket watches and silver. 
Uh, the earliest supposedly accredited, I say accredited, engine turned object of which I'm aware is in the Royal Collection, Queen Mary's Patch Box, which is dated circa 1694. However, this reveals the risk of believing what you read. I have recently seen and handled the box, and it definitely is not engine turned. Um, I've sometimes pondered, pondered where the stimulus arose for creating such patterns. Um, the creation of orderly but complex and inexplicably achieved patterns is very enjoyable and provides a puzzle to viewers. As to the basic concept or inspiration, I suggest perhaps annual rings in a piece of wood. The plaits on the little girl's hair. Or the wind formed ripples on a, a beach. Um, the desire for such patterns is ancient, as shown by these manually achieved examples of similar effect. This is an engraved tombstone from a place called Golich, which is engraved with parallel zigzag lines, which dates from 3600, 2700 BC. Straight line patterns, basically. Uh, the repousse and chasing work on this gold helmet of Kim King, wonderful name, Mescalum Doug, excavated at Ur, dated from around 2,700 years BC. If you look at the hair patterns on there, um, I suspect the maker would have loved an engine turning machine, but he probably wouldn't have been happy with Swiss prices. The desire was fostered by education in the 16th to 18th centuries, where mechanical arts, particularly ornamental turning, were a fundamental part of the education of ruling princely classes and royalty of much of Europe, many of whom had fully equipped turning rooms and professional turners as tutors. Apparently the concept was that by doing things in a considered, mathematically controlled sequence, one learned the benefits of a logical and ordered existence which could be applied to life in general. Uh, information on this subject is given in the uncommon and little known book titled Sovereigns as Turners by Klaus Morris, which is devoted solely to this topic and gives details of various important turners, including um, Peter the Great, who had a wonderful collection of machines, including, I think, 28 various complex lathes, referred to in a rare book by Nartov. The Emperor Maximilian III, Joseph of Bavaria, sh shown here at the Rose Engine with uh, the Count of Salern, painted by Johann Jacob Dorner the Elder in 1756 in Munich. Uh, other regal turners included Queen Sophie Magdalena of Denmark, King Adolf Friedrich, and Queen Louisa Ulrika of Sweden, and King Louis XVI of France. That's a Merkelein lathe, which is, uh, was Louis XVI. Um, that was a truly exquisite machine. That's another very ornate one. Um, our own Queen Victoria gave a wonderful halt for ornamental lay to her cousin Archduke Otto of Habsburg in 1886. Although it's lengthy and tortuous, I doubt I can describe this educational concept better than by reading part of the foreword from the book by Morris. Um, court society turned at the lathe. Programmed machines stood in residences from... Incidentally, that's a Bergeron lathe, sorry. Um, uh, court society turned at the lathe, program machines stood in residences from Stockholm to Florence, from Paris to Moscow, for princes to learn and for rulers to dabble in turning. From the Renaissance to the Age of Enlightenment, this is a difficult bit, the epoch of the Occident marked by the mechanization of the world picture, the Turner's lathe held a fascination, and with it a fascination for the psychological phenomenon of a predetermined course a course that was programmed and therefore ordered to the exclusion of anything incalculable. All princely turners were public figures. Nevertheless, the history of machine activity remained unheeded. Truly a history of science and the arts. For the history of art, turning was a mechanical and for turning was mechanical, and for a serious history of technology determined by progress, the turn shapes were bagatelles, useless artifacts. Um, and thus only the result of a pleasant pastime. Moreover, the aesthetically built machines and the disturbed forms, I think that's a correct term for that, uh, were tucked away in art museums. They contributed nothing to an, easier, to an approach to technology that was solely concerned with making life easier. Uh, this one is by Philip Senger. I think, uh, I'll go back, no? That's by Philip Senger, dated 1681 Florence. 
the history of social sciences saw machines only in the light of their role in the Industrial Revolution. In this field, history was determined by the contrasting pairs of capital and means of production, or exploiters and workers, that technology and machines had different functions in different societies went unnoticed. Thus, the dilettant activities of princes at programmed machines um, was also remained also remained unnoticed by social history. They were apparently too elitist to be included in the concept of a technical system that comprehended and structured the whole of civilization. If we pay no heed to the prejudice of the above-mentioned fields of learning, and particularly to the idea of progress being linear, or the machine only being associated with the Industrial Revolution, then we find that work on machines, such as the lathe, was frequently done by princes long before the machine was used for production purposes. That's the end of that text in the book. Perhaps the expression ivory towers originates from princely turners who lived in a rarefied atmosphere away from reality, making things like that. Uh, the turning of such items continues today, as shown by this splendid item by Jean-Claude Charpignon. And this is probably one of his less complex pieces, I suspect. Uh, the, the, tradition of an sorry. <laughs> the tradition of an aristocrat with a, a turning tutor persis persisted into the 1900s. An American artist, Goldsmith friend, Dan, a true New Yorker, loved rose engines, told me of his experience in the pursuit of a magnificent machine in a castle in England. He pursued it relentlessly for years, for years badgering the owner to sell. At every visit, he would meet a German who seemed to be a general factotum and a turning tutor. Apparently, the German had been captured by the aristocrat in the war and somehow became a trusted retainer. The German never spoke a word during any of Dan's visits until the last day after the lathe deal was completed when he inquired of Dan, do you want to know the secret of life? Because Dan said yes. Stay in the long grass and keep your head down. That's all he ever said to him. I will show you some photographs of some of my machines and some owned by others. Sorry, this, uh, oh sorry, these, um, these machines are difficult by but the nature is difficult to photograph. This is compounded by the lack of space and the general clutter in my workshops, despite months of tidying and preparation. Um, straight line engine, so called because the principle of operation is in a straight line up and down, and despite the name, is usually created, uh, used for creating and cutting wavy lines generated by contact with changeable pattern bars. And this image shows three typical patterns cut in a straight line engine. Uh, basic sine wave pattern, and this is one where uh, there's a, been a change of pattern bar uh, for every, every few cuts, and then the same sine wave pattern, but with the phase, the peaks and troughs of the waves moved up and down. Um, this is a straight line, a, a straight line wood bed machine by George Plant, probably from about 1900s. Not convinced that the bed is actually original, but it looks very nice. And this is a, uh, uh, an all metal machine by, uh, which one's that? That's, uh, excuse me, I can't, the angle's wrong for me here. That's the same. This is by Plant, George Plant, and the one, the type where you sit in front of it, which generally considered the most convenient to use. Um, and this is one by Leonhard, where you sit, oh, sorry, go back, to the side here. Um, I think that was no, that's the second one I ever bought. And this small machine by Lawrence Cook of Providence, Rhode Island. This includes, with a, American ingenuity, this rotating, rotating pattern bar with a rapid click ratchet on there, uh, which enables rapid changes of patterns. This, pa this shows an image of a pattern bar and the rubber, like a screwdriver nose, for want of a better description, which travels down the bar. Um, um, the, the, the rubber under spring pressure causes the workpiece mounted on the machine to move laterally to follow the pattern on the bar and the cut is made by the cutting tool held in a tool slide which is progressively moved across the face of the work for successive cuts. The cut is under thumb pressure only as the machine is operated by a hand wheel which alternately raises the workpiece and lowers it for each cut. I have a little bit of videos at the end which hopefully will make it a clearer. Uh, 
a large variety of pattern bars were available. Some have multiple patterns, multiple patterns as this one. Um, some have a single pattern on the edge. Um, <clears throat> these two pages from the book, Martin Matthews' book, shows samples of patterns that can be achieved from the same pattern bar and the same rubber. And this uh, a swatch of zinc plate showing different straight line patterns achieved by different pattern bars, identified by numbers. Um, so when you ordered your machine from George Plant or Leonhardt, you could select something to your taste. I don't know who made that, but uh, it's clearly as, just like going to a wallpaper shop or your tailors, if ever you did that anymore, order your, the pattern that you liked. Um, I'll show some brief videos showing the operation of the three basic types of machines, starting with the straight line engine. I was the unskilled cameraman, but I hope it conveys the principles of operation more clearly than my words. And I'm indebted to a friend, Phil Bedford, for his in invaluable assistance on this. Um, right. It's prepared in the best traditions of home video, and this, it's really wobbly. And we had to turn the sound off in places. It's a pity because the rhythmic noises and ratchet clicks are therapeutic, but you might have heard language which uh, was not appropriate for this audience. So, so let's see if we can get the video to work. Ah, oh. oh, I know, excuse me. Where's it gone? It's gone pixelated. Let's try again. Away we go. Those that you know will promptly see the errors of what's going on, but I won't say any more. It's very... That's gone to the next one. They're not my dirty fingernails, by the way. Somebody else pointed that out at another. Quite a difficult thing to, to video if you're trying to show the machine and the work, because you're trying to move from one point to the other on the machine. Go on to the next one. Oh, no. Totally different noise. Could you hear, have you got the sound back in the audience at all? Is it possible to do the sound? Uh, on, on, yeah, if you would do it, I'll, if I try to do it, I'll uh, spoil something. I'm from the, uh, from the laptop itself. But it should be. Hmm. A, a, sight, a sound thing on the uh, on the screen of the uh, there ought to be a sound on the actual uh, video. on the machine on the video so I'll run it probably because I've got it turned off on the on the actual laptop ah, we'll go without the sound okay. Thank you. You can see the... Oh, we've gone back to that now. It's jumping around somewhat.
This is a pattern where we've been using a pattern bar which has got a choice of patterns on it. So between a certain number of cuts, we move across onto the next, uh, onto the next pattern. So in this case, we're getting a sort of a diamond effect in the middle. I'll cut the video short, actually. So you've got this sort of diamond effect then. You can see with this next pattern, we're also moving the phases with, when you move to the top of the turret, moving the, the phases of the, uh, the peaks and troughs of the waves. So you get the effect rather like the, that little girl's plaited hair. And there's the, the pattern, you can see the, say just like that plaited hair. And we move on to the Rose engine, um, so-called, because the patterns generated are generally rather floral and generated from brass discs of rosette shape. Just typical patterns. And this is a trade rose engine by John Bower of Clerkenwell. It's got 16 rosettes and it's from about 1830, 1850. Um, shown with its original ellipse chuck, but a later Swiss uh, double eccentric chuck on it. The, trade rose, the term trade rose engine refers to machines made for commercial use rather than the exotic machines made for royalty and, and uh, wealthy amateurs. Uh, this is a, a really big trade rose engine by John Bauer of Clerkenwell. Um, it's got exceptional machines, it's got 33 rosettes, uh, they're about 10 or maybe even 12 inches diameter, and it's got a very unusual additional device on the back with a gear, a um, large gear, and an eccentric cam um, arrangement. It's also got a, a elliptical swash turning capability. There's a large ellipse chuck of iron, a straight line chuck. Uh, which convert the rotary movement into a vertical movement, uh, which in conjunction with the pencil chuck can turn engine turn on cylinders and pen bodies. And that's, that's the maker's details. And there's some of the rosettes with pumping rosettes on, on the ends of some of these. It's got a particularly unusual feature. That's this eccentric gear, or the gear here, with this eccentric cam arrangement, which enables... Uh, rosette patterns of greater dimensions that you can achieve normally with an ordinary rosette, like this kind of thing. And with gear, if gears are, if the little gear on the cam is of an unequal divisor tooth count to the main wheel, you then get a cut which advances itself automatically and sort of forms a complete, complete ribbon. Or incomplete if you decide not to keep going until the line catch up with itself. And that with a deep lobe, um, also with the eccentric cam, you can get these quite deep lobe patterns which are not so easy to achieve in other ways. And this one I rather like, a sort of error uh, by setting the thing incorrectly so that the barrel couldn't quite oscillate the full range. Got a flat on the top of the, the uh, lobes, sort of a a fortuitous error, which I rather liked. Um, this is a um, small American machine by Charles Field, 
I don't the 1930s, 40s. Um, this is a, a Swiss machine by Leonhard, uh, dated 1919. It's a very heavy, versatile machine with a chuck which combines double eccentric, ellipse and swash turning facilities, plus a straight line chuck and therefore has many capabilities. Yeah, this, all the, the overhang on some of these machines from the nose is quite surprising. And this is a little machine by William Mills, who was apprenticed to John Bauer, as shown mounted with a straight line chuck, which can convert the rotary movement to vertical up and down. Um, it has clearly seen many, many years of uh, hard service, proven by the wear on the bench. That bolt will originally have been level with the top of the wood but it's been worn down by the turner's elbow um, around the, the leg bolt. And the arc on the, the counter the, for traversing the, the slide, the original was worn through like that and welded up. Just think how many years of hand moving across that would to, to create that work, that amount of wear. Uh, as with the straight line engine, the Rose engine, except for some later motorized machines, worked manually. The headstock carrying the barrel of rosettes is rotated by a hand wheel and pulley and is pivoted below the level of the bed and by contact with a shaped rubber, normally of hardened steel, and pushed into contact under spring pressure, uh, rocks and oscillates to follow the shape of the rosette. The cutter held in a tool slide is pushed by thumb pressure against the workpiece, held on the arbor of the rosette barrel and cuts the pattern accordingly and is manually traversed across the face of the work, progressively after each cut. There are other secondary effects which can be achieved by, uh, uh, such as rotating the rosette barrel by using a ratchet click plate or worm gear so that you, you, you phase the, uh, the peaks and troughs of the waves. This was spiral type patterns appear. Gives a really quite deep, even though that's just a gnat's whisker of a cut depth, it really gives the impression of 3D. Um, this machine by, by Leonhardt was formerly cut in half by its owner. Uh, cut in half by its former owner, George Baumgartel, who I shall refer to later, to enable him to, enable him to engine turn on workpieces larger than anything envisaged by the maker. Hacking rough holes in rose engine beds to accommodate large work seems to have been a common practice. A rose engine can be used in pumping mode by using the rubber in contact with the patterns on the face of the rosettes under spring pressure. The, uh, the rosette barrel pumps backwards and forwards along with the workpiece, such as a tubular serviette ring. The pattern is then cut around the tube and the cutter is traversed along the work for each cut, or along the workpiece for each cut. The tool slide and cutter is turned parallel to the work for this purpose. There's a the slide has been turned, there's a piece of tube. And this is another piece of video. Let's see if we can. And here you can see the, the rubber running up the side of the uh, rosettes for pumping. You see it just pumping slightly backwards and forwards. It's a cut piece. Uh, this is um, cutting with, with an, an ellipse. Jumper. This is going to the, uh, the large John Bauer Rose engine. This is 
cutting a pattern using a, a gear which is unequal, the small gear on the cam of unequal divisor account. There's the adjustable turning with that thing, adjusting that little wheel on the cam there, uh, which then operates with the other gear. And th that will just, you can just rotate that until the pattern, the line catches up on itself. Or the cut catches up, up on itself. It's an unusual feature. I haven't seen on any other engine turning machine. This pattern will keep going until it, the line does actually catch up on itself. So don't have to advance the cutter at all on this, it just does it itself. I say it, the cutter doesn't, but the, uh, the machine does. And there's the sort of completed pattern. Okay. Sorry, I have difficulty here. Can, can we, if, we do, if I can do questions after with Mike, so I will lose track, and uh, I have some difficulty hearing. And this is a deep, this is with the same, uh, the eccentric gear, but just cutting with a um, normal cutting procedure with a cut, with a, the cutter being traversed between each cut as normal. But get quite deep lobes, like real floral patterns. It's a fantastic machine, this thing. It's just... Uh... And this sort of cut pattern on a piece of aluminium. Um, well, for, all, for all practical purposes, the variety of patterns that can be achieved on a straight line engine or a rose engine are limited or endless, limited only by the skill and the creative, creativity of the turner and time. Time is what we all lack. Um, the final type of machine is the Brocade engine, so named because it can, f it can form patterns which are reminiscent of, of bro brocade fabrics and which copies relief patterns from master pattern plates with an optional background of a variety of patterns derived from small rosettes or rateau is the word, These, I think it's what the Continentals use it. Um, this is a, a typical, typical pattern. The master pattern, the, the machine functions by a tracer which traces over the surface of the master pattern um, which as the pattern rotates the, pushes the tracer out of gear or out of contact, or, or out of, uh, pushes it back um, and this is the one on the, the rosettes, gives the background pattern and this one is, is on a cylinder and you've got these other Ratto, which can give sun ray type patterns. And that's the cutter and the tool holder. The, the cutter is held in a complex turret, um, which I've moved on somewhere here, I think. Uh, It's held in a sort of, sorry, I've lost track of myself. Yes, the cutter is held in a complex sort of turret here, which it just rocks, just a gnat's whisker, just to not get the depth of cut. Um, some machines have the facility to use two master patterns. This is a Brohen, an American machine, uh, one for the foreground and one for the background. And there's, that could be a background pattern and that's a, the foreground pattern. Also has the opportunity, you've got the, the ratto as well in the middle. And the ultimate machine is this uh, Woodbed Leonhard. Unfortunately, this one's not mine. It got away. Um, it also has the facility to cre create 
rose engine patterns as well as the brocade. Uh, I believe this one ended up in Dresden or somewhere. Uh, these are typical uh, brocade engine master patterns. They're about five inches, 140 millimeters, five inches diameter. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some patterns on the wall. Um, multiple patterns uh, mounted on my workshop walls. Uh, there's some videos uh, here. Let's try this. This is quite a big machine. Yeah, you can see the, uh, the tracers being pushed away from the pattern and it operates these levers which in turn by levers and springs pulls the cutter in and out of contact with the, the, the workpiece. So all these levers um, traverses all the way up to the turret and the, the, the cutter, the turret is pivoting just there, just rocking backwards and forwards just a little bit. cutter and the gauge alongside it. That's a typical uh, cut pattern with uh, rows and sort of some ray patterns. And try to remember that pattern there if you can. That's a as a Waltham watch dial, go back to that one, it's the same pattern. Uh, so, a more unusual use is a coffin plate I made for my sister Thelma, who lived and had a family in Sweden, but who sadly she died in 2013. So, it's a mixture of brocade work and engine turning. On a more cheerful note, a marriage medal, I gave it to my wife Anita on the day our youngest daughter, Rebecca, got married. Not much of a reward for 36 years of putting up with me and my manias. <laughs> oh, there we are. There's the... There's the <laughs> <laughs> Did she earn it? Did she earn it? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Brocadia machines incorporate a variety of optional features including ellipse chucks, straight line chucks and vaulting devices which will enable them to cut a pattern across a curved workpiece, even one with a combination of curves such as on powder compacts. There are other variants on all three basic machine types, especially brocade engines, where almost every machine is different. I have some others which are not shown. Uh, I show here images of engine turning workshops of some of the best known jewellers. This is Cartier uh, of Paris from a book called Cartier the Legend by Gilbert, I can't pronounce it, Gilbert Gautier. Um, it's a super book because it's got all sorts of sociological information in it, um, quite a bit of scandal, including the prices of some of the courtesans by the hour that they used to charge uh, their upper class clients. Um, this is uh, Fabergé, uh, a book, Unknown Fabergé by Professor Alexander Ivanov. Uh, unobtainable, I believe, this book. Two pictures there, really Russian chaps with their beards. And these are Swiss turners operating Leonhard Rose engines, brocading machines, from a book, Horological Shop Tools, by Ted Crom, who some of you will remember. Um, this picture shows uh, one of the major joys of any interest, sharing it with others. My good friend and fellow enthusiast, Phil Bedford, formerly had ET machines at Amberley Working Museum, so others, especially children, could enjoy a hands-on experience of, of using a machine they never knew existed, using their own ideas and hands to create a pattern on a workpiece to take home and treasure. 
this child was three years old. And what better way can there be to spread knowledge and the joy of making? All of my machines uh, were used for trade purposes and some of the Rose engines will have been worked hard for perhaps 100 years or so. The trade seems to have died to have something, something of a boom in the early, it died, um, sorry, the trade seems to have something of a boom in the early to mid 1900s, then it virtually died. However, due to the renaissance of the high value Swiss mechanical watch, there is now a significant re-emergence of the technique in providing decorated movements parts and dials, some of which are particularly beautiful. This isn't one. Uh, I will follow with a series of photographs, including uh, a variety of objects. ET is difficult to photograph because of the reflections it creates. In other cases, it's somewhat masked, but enhanced by translucent enamel. The beauty can only be really appreciated with the objects in the hand and oscillated. Um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. This pewter pot is so ugly, I just had to have it. I mean, it stands about 16 inches tall. It really is, it, may, it actually made me laugh when I first saw it. I don't know why, but um, anyway, this is an egg um, made by John Morehouse in England. He's also made the uh, singing bird mechanism inside it. There's a brocaded and enameled silver box. Um, the geometric pattern on the glass ceiling of a light well at a security printing company called Komori. Uh, they made that they created the pattern somehow using the Kampf geometric lathe and then uh, somehow et enlarged it and etched it on, on glass. And that's uh, an etched pattern, of, no, a cut on a Kampf geometric lathe through a, a wax resist on a glass plate as used for security printing. And this is some security printing, uh, sort of a montage of the security printing patterns that could be achieved in the Kempf lathe. It is engine turning in a most complex form. And these are um, flute mouthpieces or embouchés. Uh, Gene Sagerman uh, lives somewhere up in uh, Maine, I believe. Uh, it's an engine turned watch movement by Rice Arthur of Liverpool. The dust covers engine turned and has the car. Never seen that before. Um, supposedly English, but the gilding is weak, which always makes me suspect Swiss involvement. <laughs> Prejudice is allowed? No, um, seriously, their movements generally were lousy gilding. And, uh, it's, uh, anyway, this is a truly superb dial by a chap called uh, Derek Pratt, an English watchmaker who worked in Switzerland for Urban Jurgensen. This dial was a reject the tiniest of blemishes, and he would a truly superb piece of work. These uh, dials by uh, for Vacheron and Constantin, turned by a, a, a gentleman from Thailand called, lovely name, Super Chai. Uh, he creates dials in the illusory art style of MC Escher. They're beautiful. He says it's easy. These are watches, which are silver lever, 1847, English watch. And that one's got quite a lot of different patterns on it. Close up of it. Uh, an English watch, the center seconds with straight line work on it. And what I rather like is when you get the combination of hand engraving and engine, and engine turning within, within the watches. And this is, I'll turn them sideways because they were too tall to get in the picture, but a, a Liverpool watch with engine turn, rose engine turn, and multicolored gold appliques. I remember seeing that watch, I forget how old it was, perhaps 20, 21, in an antique, a very posh antiques arcade. It was totally black, no hands, the dial was black and oxidized. And I'd gone in there, the lady um, and her husband, Mrs. Jacobi, they wanted 20 quid for it. The man, the owner of the shop, wouldn't deal with me. He thought it was a complete waste of space. Uh, but she persuaded him to let me have it. I couldn't wait to get it home and clean it and bring it up, bring it back to life. And uh, I just, still one of my favorite watches. And this, again, very ornate, multicolored gold, Liverpool watch, quarter repeater. Beautiful engine turning. Most of the engine turning on pocket watches, when you look at it, it's quite, you know, it's. Plenty good enough, but um, not flawless, but this one 
is. Uh, these are watches from Krot auctions in uh, Germany. Blue enamel over the engine turning. Chinese type watch. Blue enamel over engine turning, pearls. Cheap little alarm clock, brass. And a truly superb English carriage clock with uh, a lot of things you can't appreciate these things unless you get them in your hands. But uh, I think that one was about £30,000, so uh, it didn't stay in my hands <laughs> for lo about 10 seconds, I think, I handled it. Gold boxes from Crot Auctions. Uh, these are musical boxes. And that's a Fabergé box. That's, I think that was, image was given to me by Mar Maria Betterly. I think she's a New Yorker. Silver box, Fabergé box. Fabergé box, Wartskis. The pattern, the moiré pattern under a yellow enamel. And that uh, sort of a card case, again from uh, Wartskis. They're quite gaudy, but when the workmanship is splendid, as, as these are, it's a engine turn butterfly under enamel. No way can the image, you cannot capture these on photographs. It just. Dance carnet with a pencil. The ladies would uh, book their dance partners, write them in the little book. Nine carat, bog standard English production um, cigarette case from the probably 1930s. All of this sort of stuff just goes straight in the melting pot now. Nobody seems to look after them and collect them. And you've got these hair brushes, um, you know, uh, a big market in well, manufacturing in England and in America making these dressing table sets. Now these images seem to have got shrunk. The, these are two, a matched pair of blue brushes. Um, going back to those items, um, not everybody is an enthusiast of engine turning. I found this article in a book a few months ago which made me wince. It's, uh, a book called Medieval Craftsmanship and the Modern Amateur by a chap called Newton Weathered. Uh, it says, one necessary consequence of the interference of machinery upon a handicraft is that the work becomes more and more immaculately perfect in precision and finish. Measurements are intensely accurate. Circles, domes and lines are literally machine made and artistic license is firmly discouraged. No more convincing example of the tendency can be cited than the type of convoluted, convoluted design which may indeed be suited to florid commercial decoration but is now freely exploited on trinket boxes and other objects appropriate to the toilet table. Um, it is nothing more than a scientific inscription and possesses a minimum of artistic value. Possibly it may be admired for a meretricious prettiness when covered by an unbroken sheet of very transparent enamel. But these soulless records of elaborate lathe work excite an interest, if the question is clearly analysed, only by a puzzled curiosity in a terrifying form of immaculate regularity. This instinct is directly opposed to the artistic sense which recognises that unexpectedness and an occasion of delighted surprise invariably accompanies this accompanies fine design. The acid test of great art is that its effect is to produce an emotion of the heart, a catching of the breath, warmth of feeling that glows in the veins. What emotion, it may be asked, except for the most superficial, can be aroused by a coldly intricate, intricate but meaningless filling of spaces? That's a real brutal reference to that. <laughs> I did actually wince when I read it, but I looked, uh, however, opinions of what constitutes art vary greatly. For example, some art scholars and collectors evidently valued Tracy Emin's bed at over two million pounds. In America, you may not know what that was, but uh, as an English artist, and she had a bed surrounded by dirty knickers and pear brushes and sundry other horrible things that you find in bedrooms as art and she sold it to Saatchi for 2.2 million quid, something like that. So, Anyway, each to their own. As long as people like that don't start collecting rose engines. 
Um, in this next set of images uh, demonstrate that, uh, what do you say? The following nine boxes are by Cartier, commissioned by Peter Wilding in the 1960s to demonstrate that the skills still existed. Um, they're believed to have been engine turned by a Swiss turner living in an engine called George Noyce and were enamelled by Kempson and Morga, and they're in the British Museum. Apparently the story is, this chap was a wealthy man. He was walking up Bond Street with the Peter Fleming, the author of the Bond's books, and Peter Fleming looked into the shop and there was a lovely gold box and said, I bet you can't get anything like that made nowadays. And he decided to prove that it could be. And these things are truly superb. You examine them, you get them it's flawless. No photo can do justice to them. Some of the designs I don't particularly like, but the workmanship is just mind-boggling. Much better than a lot of the Fabergé stuff you'd see. That one in particular is really lovely. All those eyelets, those, they're all perfectly positioned um, on the sides and on the top of the box. You know, their alignment is it's just gorgeous. And they're heavy as well. They didn't skimp with the metal. Oh, we'll come on to older things. This is a gold box by DF... Putro, it's in the V&A. I forget the date, but you're looking the you know, late, mid to late 1700s. Two images of the same thing. Then this box is by Charles Etienne Lemaire, 1762, 1763. It's in the V&A Museum. Um, this box is delightfully referred to by Kenneth Snowman in his, box, in his book, Gold Boxes of Europe, where he writes, chased gold... Chased snuff box decorated on all its surfaces with different patterns of engine turning as though the maker, so intrigued by this technique, could not stop doodling. <laughs> for many years I thought of engine turning as being a technique for decorating small objects, boxes, powder compacts and watch cases with the occasional larger objects such as a salver or a tray. A visit to an ornamental turner's meeting in Pennsylvania many years ago opened my eyes with astonishment and wonder when I saw samples of very large work pieces of work done by an Austrian engraver engine turner called George Baumgartel who'd immigrated to the USA. I became acquainted with the owner of these articles, George Shaw, then an elderly man who was the owner of a large, sophisticated engineering factory, but was also an enthusiast for lathes and engine turning. Um, George Baumgartel was equally adept at hand engraving, complex die making, etching, carving, and above all, engine turning, where to the best of my knowledge, his work is unequaled in size, range, diversity, and design. Um, the most notable feature of George Baumgartel's work was his engine turn plates done for the Gem Lloyd Corporation, which were used with this patented process for creating engine turn patterns onto celluloid sheets, which were then cut up and the patterns fitted to hairbrushes, powder compacts, um, and uh, dressing table sets to simulate engine turning under translucent enamel. An interesting example of a supreme master of his craft creating masterworks for the purpose of generating multiple spurious, low-cost copies of superb engine turning. And this plate, that's about 20 inches by about 14 inches. You know, it's a big, big piece of metal. Details of some of the uh, patterns on them, hand engraving and engine turning. This was another a batch of dark, again, a plate about 20 inches by uh, 14 inches. Dials, close-up of some of those dials. Um, one of the gem the plastic sheets used for press that they use. I don't know how they actually did it. I've, I've not been able to find out the process, but truly wonderful. This piece is about 15 inches by about 12. Just a ship. A diary and flowers. This is a piece of gemloid sheet. That flower, fairly close up. Close up on the flower. 
Rose engine work, straight line work. He was a clever chap. Um, I've got about two tons of those plates. Um, I think it, most of them are about 500 millimeters, about 350 millimeter. The problem I have is storage. The only place I can keep them is under my floor. And the only way I can get to them is sliding around on a belly trolley. Baumgartel's workbooks are fascinating. I'll show sample pages. This is a page for how he created patterns for a Revlon powder compact. Uh, and references to how he created certain straight line patterns. And this is again a rose engine pattern. It tells you what rosette he used, how many notches, what waves, how many notches on the, the ratchet on the side, how many cuts. Rather Teutonic workbooks. It spells out in detail how he did it. Um, he was a, Baumgartel was a recognised craftsman and some of his work was used for very important events such as 1939 New York World's Fair for which he used en the engine, he engine turned the plates used for producing the postcards, guidebooks, diaries and images for publicity literature including the Book of Nations. Um, that's the, the plate. Um, he also did, uh, these are plates used for, again, part of creating the gemloid patterns. T truly mind-boggling engine turning. Um, this page uh, refers to engine turn one of the plates for the World's Fair. It took him 135 hours over 17 days. Just imagine the strain, one incorrect cut and it's finished. Yeah? George Shaw had, oh these are the workbooks, you know. George Shaw had a private, um, private museum in Franklin, Pennsylvania to which he admitted very few people. I, it was an amazing emporium of all things mechanical which George told me were things no one valued and he rescued from the roadside or scrap. Memorable pieces including an electrical chair for medical purposes. Apparently this administered an electric shock at the same time as vigorous multi-directional multi vibrations. He also had the world's first iron lung with multiple breastplates. Um, I visited George Shaw twice to, visit, to view George ba Baumgartel's work and workshop record books which I always intended to return with a better camera, some photographic knowledge, lighting and with time and diligence to record and photograph everything. Uh, sadly I never achieved the return visit until years later when the collection was auctioned. But I have a vivid memory of a, a freezing cold day in uh, his museum with George Shaw. Both of us crouched over a grocery box containing paperwork from and about George Baumgartel, including letters, passports, and best of all, his workbooks, which described in great detail his clients, designs, and work methods, including tool shapes and how he achieved the engine turn patterns on particular work pieces, as well as the time taken to complete them. Uh, George Shaw was a successful businessman, a gentleman, a clever, capable, and sensitive man, and I always remember what he said. It seems to me that most of the religions of the world offer some vision of the afterlife where one gets to meet again with the people you've loved or respected. When I look through this box of papers, I like to think I get a foretaste of heaven. Um, George Shaw died a few years ago, and I sincerely hope, for his sake and ours, that that is true. Yeah? I cannot personally think of a better reason for being a collector or an enthusiast for anything if it can generate such feelings. I will finish with a picture of the most important item in, in my collection. My wife, Anita. She's accompanied me to where I've worked in some of the less desirable parts of the world and has supported me without fail in all my endeavours, including my engine turning and other manias, because I've got plenty of others as well. Uh, without Anita, none of this would have been possible. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, if there's time. <laughs> Come along now. Jay, Don't be shy. I have a question. Yeah. The, the, the big plates yes. that he engraved seem almost too big for any straight line machine I've ever as, seen. As far as I can tell, he did it on that rose engine, oh. which he cut in half. 
<coughs> on the backs of some of the plate, I found a piece of, uh, what do you call the floor, the floor, like fencing mesh, to check a, uh, what do you call it, not check a plate, but the fencing mesh, we covered in pitch, and some of the plates, the back of them, had that, the image on it. So I think somehow he did those plates. None of them, um, none of them had, if I'm going from memory now, none of them had long cuts on them. They were big plates, but with multiple images on them. So he was able to shunt it up and down in order to get the pattern to where he wanted. Um, I believe he did have a straight, there was a straight line engine in the works when he was sold, but there was no time to function or see or observe what it was. As far as I know, it was all done on that big Leonhard. Yeah. You can do better than this. Come on, there's got to be some questions. No? How many machines total? Sorry? How many machines total? Who for? How many do you have total? Me. Um, I don't know. In machines, in turn. I believe I have... 22 various kinds of engine turning machine, including brocading machines. Uh, you have to remember I started collecting a long while ago when a lot of this stuff was being scrapped. Those plates, a lot of it would have gone, I've got, what you've seen there is only a Nat's whisker of stuff, plates. A lot of it would have gone straight in the bin. Um, a lot of the brass plates I bought, people were weighing them at the auction on scales that were also going to be auctioned. I think a lot of them would have gone straight in the scrap. So I thought, save them. It's uh, where I hope to keep it all together and that somehow I can keep it together and pass it on to somebody else that appreciates it ultimately. The question is how the hell to display it because you'd probably require most of this wall <coughs> and they're heavy. Um, and not many people are interested in that kind of thing so they, they go in the bin, you know. So I save what I can. As far as lathe, I've got a lot of lathe. Watchmakers' lathes, I just like machines. Um, I don't necessarily go out. Yes, I do seek certain things, but a lot of it, I get told about things, and uh, I've been fortunate to be able to do it. Um, it happens less and less now, although I did get one more two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> My bank manager knows me of old. I... I always go in and say I need a loan for something I've already bought. You know, so uh, anyway, what more can I say? <laughs> I need, um, oh yes, uh, Michael and Susan Brooks have been to uh, SEMA Works and seen the mania of it. Uh, I've got four, uh, in England we have no space, property costs too much money. Um, so I've got a converted double garage and two small workshops alongside. Another bit of a store up on a pig farm about five miles away. I'm going to build another workshop in the garden. But I need a room this size, ideally, so you can walk around them. But you can't. They just, they just have to go where I can put them. So, but I do the best I can. So? <coughs> well, uh, uh, the, uh, the ultimate ambition was to have some kind of a working museum. But I'm nearly 70. Uh, the chances of acquiring the level of money for that is gone. And after all, not that many, only very specialist sort of people would be interested. But the idea is to have them all visible and working, if only I could. But anyway. OK, anything else? Sorry? So, yes. I, mine doesn't work yet. The motor for mine, unfortunately, is in the Science Museum. Um, so I've not got my motorized, but that, I have seen one working. Um, there's, there's one in the USA, there's one in Germany, and one in, in England that is up and running. And I think they can leave it running for... I don't know how long it would be to... I mean, it's a mind-bogglingly capable machine. Um, I have seen that we saw the last person who used them commercially. They was we were able to video it. Um, in again that Japanese film, Komori, they still had one and they had the chap who used to operate it. It was originally a hand engraver. And I think the comment I like most, they took us to the, uh, the engraving workshop. Everything was done now by computer, those things outdated. Um, and the chap who operated the, the computer to 
create the plates now, said there's one thing the computer lacks. It's a taste button. <laughs> Sorry, you had that, uh, okay? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm oh, I was wondering if you had come across any machines with the engine turning on glass. Yes, George Plant, George Plant if you look in, the, uh, in the, the book, the engine turning book, they had machines for glass. For Have you seen them? I, I know about that reference. I've got a feeling the one might be one in the reserve, the Science Museum in Birmingham. I wrote them, but they never got back they, to This is why stuff should never go to museums. They had a wonderful display of the most magnificent lathes, including the French royal type ones. They took them all off display. They stuck them in a store. And I wrote to them saying, can I come and see these machines? If you can tell us which machines you want to see, we'll make them available to you. But we don't know what we've got. Now, since that time, they have, um, I think ornamental turners and other people have made some kind of an inventory. But if you go there, they're up on racks, you know, they're 50 feet above the ground. Stuff should never go to museums like that because it goes off display, it's not accessible, and it never will come back out again. And the curators don't know what the hell they've got. Science Museum, and Science Museum is not so bad. The current curator does have an interest. The previous curator had a lot of interest. But again, it's all stuck in store. So, anyway, that's my personal view. Um, only very special things should go to museum. With the stuff we've got, people can come and see it. They could come and use it. I'm happy. That's what I want people to do. Um, is if it goes in the museum, oh, you can't touch that. You know, it, no, it's too, too precious. Um, some things are too precious to be touched, but um, not these machines. Well, it's a, ob those machines, if you look in the Swiss catalogues, it's sometimes refer to those brocading machines as it, automatic engraving machines, brocading machines. Medallion, I sometimes refer to them as a medallion machine, but uh, in real terms, I think a medallion machine is the sort of things used in coin making and metal making, which are the true reducing machines for making the dies for stamping, um, stamping that. They're the true medallion machines. I've only got five of them. <laughs> I'm sorry? I said I was hoping you put up some of the pictures of the work that you've done with the medallions that are buying with the ornamental furniture in your box. Basically, I, the only stuff I've made seriously have been family medals for coffin plates, children's christening medals, and other odds and sods, which have They've, they've gone, you know. I've got some in, in my bag, I've got some of the uh, sample patterns. When I've started to make something, I've got them on copper discs uh, where I've tried to work the thing out to get the, the patterns to cut properly before I cut them on silver. I'll bring them down tomorrow. A lot of them are very badly cut. Uh, they're often, they're very tarnished, but I will bring some, bring some down, if that helps. But they're... I'm not proud of any of them. <laughs>